When Neil Armstrong stepped out onto the moon, it was one of the defining moments of the decade. And British audiences were treated to a first-hand account when Patrick Moore interviewed Armstrong on his return to Earth. Mr Armstrong, you're one of the very, very few people, I think, whose opinion on this is really worth having. In fact, there are only four of you. I do realize that when you were on the moon, you had very little time for gazing upwards. But could you tell us something about what the sky actually looks like from the moon, the sun, the earth, the stars, if any, and so on? The sky is uh, a deep black uh, when viewed from the moon, as it is when viewed from uh, cislunar space, the space between the earth and the moon. The uh, the Earth is the only visible object other than the Sun that can be seen, although there have been some reports of seeing planets. I myself did not see planets from the surface, but I suspect they might uh, be visible. The Earth is quite beautiful from space uh, as, uh, and from the Moon. It looks quite small and quite remote, but uh, it's very blue and covered with uh, white lace <laughs> of the clouds. and. The continents are clearly seen, although they have very little color from that distance. Interviews like this proved so popular that Patrick Moore succeeded in wooing a new, young audience of would-be astronomers. I was always interested in rockets and space, even as far back as I can remember, probably to about five or six. But it was when I was ten in 1968 that I picked up a friend's copy of the Observer's Book of Astronomy by Patrick Moore. And for the first time, I saw pictures in that book that were actually of telescopes that were bigger than high street telescopes, but not as big as professional telescopes on mountains. I suddenly realized that there were people in their back gardens doing real astronomy that was of use. And so from that moment on, I think I was pretty much hooked. You know, I'm asked many times every week how one starts taking up astronomy as a hobby. And I always give the same answer. You don't, in fact, need any optical equipment whatsoever. And you certainly don't need a large and expensive telescope. And my advice is that if you want to start taking a real interest in astronomy, the very first step is to buy a star map, which only costs a shilling or two, and then go out and learn your way around the sky. Of course, one thing one's got to bear in mind straight away is the question of cost. If one's only got a very limited amount of money to spend on equipment, and this certainly applies to most of us, then there's a straightforward choice between a very small telescope or a pair of binoculars. As it happens, one amateur at the time was already showing you didn't even need a pair of binoculars to make a discovery. It was in this homemade observatory in his back garden that Graham Hostey was keeping a routine check on the stars, as he's done almost nightly for the last ten years, using the most primitive of astronomical equipment, half an old pair of binoculars, when he spotted something new. Within seconds, he realized it was a hitherto undiscovered Nova star, and was just able to record his findings before it disappeared behind the nearby rooftops. The amateur's tireless commitment to patrolling the skies in all weathers was one of the driving forces behind this tradition. The national passion for making things was another. The English tradition is deeply pragmatic. It's the product of people who not only wanted to know the structure of the universe, where it came from, how it was made, but had a fascination with the nuts and bolts of instruments. How do I make a bigger telescope? a more stable telescope. It's not a speculative tradition. It's not a tradition which is driven by woolly thinking. It's, it's very, very much of a hands-on tradition. My grandfather used to work at Land's End Radio and being out there on night duty, he got bored looking out at nothing across the, the sea, so he made a telescope. And um, my father made telescopes from all the bits and I used to make telescopes. And then he led on from there. And in fact, some of the bits of the telescope are actually there now on this bench. Those are some of the bits that were made, that part of his telescopes that were made oh, 60, 70, 80 years ago, not that. This, this bit, 60, 70, 80 years are just scraps. I don't know what happened to the main telescopes, they've all gone. 
I suppose after World War II, it became possible very, very suddenly to make quite good instruments cheap because, of course, things like lenses used in periscopes in submarines suddenly had no purpose. You could buy them for about five pounds. These were absolutely top quality lenses. And the equipment used by what they called WD, War Department Reject Material, uh, suddenly made it possible for all kinds of people to put decent instruments together.